Greet you, saints, in the name of the Lord. Leviticus chapter 25, please. This uh, thought that I'm going to use as my title tonight is in itself pretty dynamic. It's a quote from Brother Branham. Heaven consists of the word. And when you think about that, it just kind of takes on all kinds of dynamic proportions. Where did Adam and Eve fall from? The Word. What are we being taken back to? The Word. Where are we seated? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's all, we see, we see the tie together there of the two. We have fallen from a dimension called the Word. And you remember there's a one time Brother Branham called the Word the eternal Word. And so there is a, there is a place where God is now bringing us back to. And it's, we're being brought back to there, right? We're at the ushering in by the opening of the seven seals. So that's why I want to do a little more preliminary like Jeff did uh, the other day before we physically get into the seals. But, uh, but the, uh, somebody was talking with us the other day and they were talking about what an event the opening of the, of the seals was. It is, uh, it is not just an advancement in theology. It is much, much more dynamic than that. And so I, that's why I want to keep uh, expounding here uh, along this line <clears throat> before we actually physically get into the seals. Leviticus 25, we're going to go into the Jubilee because in the New Testament it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And a Jubilee is to set you free. So consequently, the the very, the very sounding of the message trumpet is, is the jubilee sound to those that can hear it, to be set free. And so there are certain principles involved in the jubilee that I wanted us to, uh, to uh, touch on. Leviticus 25, starting at verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. So you go back to your root or back to your origin. And considering that we, we are counted in Adam and Eve, then that's where I'm counting from. I'm not counting from the book of Acts, though that's nice. I'm counting all the way back to Eden. Because this message did not come to take us back to the book of Acts. It came to take us back to Eden. So we're going, we're going all the way back. So a trumpet of truth is sounded to give us a jubilee. Verse 13. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. See, that's the second time that it's emphasized that. Skip down to verse 24. And in all the land, your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, let's pause right there now. It was our inheritance that was sold down the drain. Uh, have you got the ability to redeem it? Oh, so it says, if, if a man has the ability, he can do his own redemption. But if you don't have the ability, then you've got to look for a kin. Right. Verse 27. Then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it. Then he may return to his possession. That's if he has the ability. The overplus, if you're wondering about that, when they bought a piece of land that had been given through Joshua to a family, and then that land, maybe the man got in financial situation and had to sell it. He could not sell it with what we would call a title deed. He only sold it with the value to the next Jubilee. Because at Jubilee, it automatically came back to the original person. So then therefore... But if he could redeem it, then he redeems it by paying the man what the value is from that point to Jubilee. What, what kind of land value, what kind of crop value, what can be redeemed, and then he, then he buys it back again. Verse 28. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that has bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his 
possession. So then it automatically goes back to the original owner. So consequently, the principle lies in this, that God has given certain possession, gave certain possessions to Israel. Then Joshua took the people into their possession and, and gave each tribe their piece of land. Then the leaders in the tribes divided it up among the families. Now that's theirs permanently. So in the New Testament, we'd say gifts and callings are without repentance. But so then, but then they may reach a financial state where they need to borrow against the land, sell the land for a while, do something, but they cannot permanently sell the land because it's theirs. It was given to them by inheritance, and it's never, they're never to lose their inheritance. Now, if God laid down those kind of laws for the children of Israel, then that's the kind of laws He has for us. So that's why we're reading it. It is not a matter of, oh, well, that's the way it was under the law. No, that's God's principle. And so consequently, who was the original owner of earth? God himself. So then, therefore, he, the, he then passed it to Adam and Eve. They then forfeited the deed to earth by transgressing the, the uh, uh, what can I say, the, the deed commandments, you, you, you have to build a so many square foot house on this piece of land or you can't keep on the land kind of thing. Well, so they didn't keep the deed commandments. You can eat of that tree, but don't you dare eat of that tree. But they, so they, they forfeited their right to the land because they didn't keep the agreement of the contract with the deed. So therefore it goes back to the original owner, which is God. It couldn't go to Satan. He never had a right in it in the first place. Though he deceived them into losing it, it can't go to him. It has to go back to the original owner. So that's how in Revelation chapter 5, we see one sitting on the throne with a book in his hand. It's the book. It's the book of redemption. It's the title deed to what Adam and Eve lost. Because it went back into the hands of the original owner. Let's read on just a little bit. Further now, verse 29. And if a man selling a dwelling house in a wall city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year he may redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the wall city shall be established forever to him that bought it. Throughout, all, throughout his generations it shall not go out in the jubilee. But the houses in the villages, which have no walls about, round about them, they shall be counted as the fields in the country, and they shall be redeemed. They shall go out in the jubilee. Cities are like churches or gathering places. And so consequently, a wall city would represent denomination. And so after just a short time, it's not redeemable. God just lifts his hand from it. They have no promise. But the ones who remain outside the walls, they're free to follow the Spirit and the Word wherever they want to go. See, then that's, that's all redeemable. Can't, can't, can't be lost. I, uh, Isaiah 63, just uh, one verse, verse uh, 16 Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. And this redeemer is the Hebrew word goel, G-O-E-L, which means kinsman redeemer. So that's the very... Uh, Scripture that had to be fulfilled for, for redemption. That's, that's why when Ruth and Naomi left the land where they were and came back into Israel, they immediately wanted to start drawing close to Boaz because he was not only their near kin, but he was also wealthy enough to do the work of redemption and buy back. So they're, they're Boaz. So they were looking for a kinsman who had the ability to redeem. Just being kin wasn't good enough. He had to have ability. So now, so now we've seen that Israel says, Our Father, you are our Redeemer. But he didn't do the act of redemption under the title Father. Is that right? Okay. 
Let's go now a little bit further. Let's go to uh, let's go to John eight, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John eight. <clears throat> That's the one that I already quoted to you, but I just want you to see it in your scripture because <clears throat> the, the Jubilee is a going free. And that's, that's what's mentioned here. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they answered, we be Abraham's seed were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? Because when a man sold his piece of land, farm, house in a non-walled city to some, many times they sold themselves into bondage to work off a debt. And so then they were then, they were actually slaves. But God told Israelites, do not treat your fellow, your fellow Israelites when, when you have to bring them in under this condition of servitude you are not to treat them like a bond slave. You're to treat them like a hired person, hired slave. There, there is a difference. And the, so the, uh, but still going into bondage types it back out again. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Ephesians chapter one, verse five. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption. There's our word again. In whom we have redemption. He has bought back for us all that we lost. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 13 in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. So the Holy Spirit is the down payment on our inheritance, which has already been bought for us. But we can't get it until the rest of the family can get theirs too. God is waiting until all, all the family is in to, re to receive it. But so to let us know that it's already been paid, we've had our earnest, the Holy Ghost is given to us to say, it's all yours already. Just wait till the rest of the family is ready and you can take it. Which were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, down payment, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of of his glory. Redemption has been paid for, it has just not yet been claimed. And the claiming, of course, was, was, was started in motion, not fully yet, but is started in motion by the opening of the seals. That's the initiation of the claim. The, but the claim is not yet. The, uh, the word has gone out to gather all the redeemed back in, Ephesians 1.10. Gathering everything back into Christ. The seals, when the seals were opened, the word went out to do that. Gather everything back into Christ where, where, it, where it came from. But as long as the body is sitting on the throne as a memorial of the blood, the work of redemption is still going on because grace is still there. One day, quoting out of the Revelation of Jesus Christ series, Revelation chapter 5, I think it's part 3, Brother Branham says, the body sits on the throne as a memorial of the blood. He says, one day he leaves the throne calls for her and meets her in the air. Amen. So when he leaves the throne, now many are preaching he left the throne in 1963. He did not. He did not. Many say, well, he left the throne for denominations and only the elect can receive it. He, the throne, every, time, every time the word moved in every age, it was always off the throne for the previous ages because they fell into the category of foolish virgins. So that's no new thing. Because we have to walk in the light as he is in the light. So that we can't say, oh, that's a new thing. It's not. That happened in every age. So there consequently then, he has not come off the throne to take the book. The book that was taken in 1963 was to open the seals, the book of Revelation. But then there's a big, a big something in there that God has been slowly trying to open our minds to see. 
Because when we say we think book, we think of a, a cover and pages and print on a page, and and that's a book. It, it is, but in God's terms, there's other kinds of books. A book is merely a gathering of words, and you are word. So when he when he leaves the throne to take the book, it is the living book. It is the bride of Christ because the word that was in this book has to go into flesh. And when he calls for that book, this book is finished for us. We don't need it anymore. It's all in here. Then he calls, then the blood is off the mercy seat. Are we staying together now so far? <clears throat> we, when we went back through the book of life years ago, we traced it out and we found that this sequence was the way that it was. We're talking now about the opening of the seals, wherein, and Jeff read it for you on Sunday, that the Lamb was the only worthy one to go and take the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And that book was the book of redemption. But when we go, when we, first of all, let's look at it in absolute utter simplicity. Can we add to or take from this book, the Bible? Cannot. So we cannot have another book that's going to add information outside of this book. Are we staying together? So consequently then the book of redemption, we start tracing it down. The book of redemption is the Bible New Testament portion. Because there was no redemption going taking place in the Old Testament. It was the promise of the redemption that was to come. So the book of redemption, so therefore what was being held in the right hand of him that sat on the throne was the mysteries of this book. There were certain things, I thank thee, Father, that how that it pleased thee to hide these things from the eyes of the wise and prudent, but reveal in, in due season. So therefore, the book then was actually this book, but gauze over our eyes, blinders over our eyes, so that we read certain things we just didn't understand. I heard uh, Brother uh, Vin Dial from Trinidad one time say it in a real simple way. He said, how does God hide something in his word? He says, by saying it a certain way. He said, how does he unveil it in the word? By saying it another way. Amen. And then your eyes are opened. That's why when Brother Branham came along, he used a certain kind of grammar that for us, it opened it up. Yes. And for the others, they stumbled all over it because this didn't sound right. But what he was doing, he was unveiling the books. Just say it another way. So then the book of redemption is the Bible New Testament portion, which is also the book of life. And in the book of life, excuse me is a book of life, and in the book of life, a portion is the Lamb's book of life. We've gone through that in the past. We won't do it. So the whole thing is the Bible. But the Bible is the Word, and the Word is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ stepped out from the Logos, which is Christ, and so therefore the Word was made flesh in this version, now came into printed version. Are we staying together? But it all came from the mind of God, before the foundation of the world. So consequently, all of this comes out <clears throat> from the invisible one. And so it's all a portion of the word. There's nothing to add to or take from the word. It is the complete revelation of all that God would have to do for us. <clears throat> in, uh, I'll just read it to you. I got it written here. In Luke 1, 68, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So the God of Israel stepped into flesh. Now, why did God step into flesh? Because he had to meet his own law, which said the Redeemer must be a kinsman. And so therefore God, in, in the form of spirit, was not our kin. So therefore he had to be born of a woman like we're born of women, and so that he could become our kin by coming a fellow human also so that he would be kin to us and could therefore do the work of redemption because his own word said the redeemer must be a near kin so he had to become our kin to be able to redeem us in the 
as I was writing this, my mind went back to Eden. And I couldn't help but wonder about Adam's thoughts. And he had been told, let's just, uh, yeah, well, let's go look. We've got some younger ones among us. Let's go to Genesis just a moment. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 2, the, starting at the end of verse 5, God starts the awareness that there is no man to till the ground. And in verse 7, he forms the man. In verse 8, he puts him in the garden. And then in verse 9, they let us know that, verse 9, and out of the ground, we're in Genesis 2, 9, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, semicolon, for the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is no statement that they also grew out of the ground. It's just that they were also considered to be trees. So therefore he's differentiated by, from the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from the other trees. And then verse 15, and he took, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And then after then, now he's already got the word on it, but at this point Adam is still alone. And then next God makes the remark that it's not good for man to be alone, and, and he brings his Eve out of him, and they're in fellowship. And then in chapter 3, we found this old slick fellow called the serpent, then he talks Eve into adding to or taking from the Word of God. So as soon as he talks her into that, she is being encouraged to partake of knowledge outside the Word. Right. Now, there are many who are still doing that. They spend all their time dabbling in, some, in non-vindicated Word. And they get their mind full of that stuff that has a totally uncertain trumpet sound. And they can't, they can't mix, you, excuse me, you can't mix God's word with other things and expect a pure crop to produce in your life. It won't work. So consequently, even when I, when I spoke to the ministers meeting, at the ministers meeting in Canada twice to the people up there, and I remarked to them up there that when a, when a young man comes into the message, especially one who feels he's got a call on his life, anybody really, but, but especially a minister, for the first seven, eight, nine, ten years, don't look at anything but the message. Nothing. So that you've got that filter solidly in place that you know what a prophet said. Now, there are men who specialize in certain areas of the Bible that have got some good things to say, but every one of them have a little mix. But they've got some good things to say that are right. And pull through the filter, you'll find that it illuminates things that a prophet just touched on. And I personally, I'm willing to look at those things, but not until after years of nothing, nothing, nothing. When I came to the message, I threw away every commentary. I threw away everything I had because I didn't want to pollute my thinking. And for, I would say for myself, it was probably, for me, it was probably 15 years before I would even look at anything outside the message because I didn't want to hybrid the seed in me. I didn't want to mix a mix of man's opinion and thus saith the Lord because it won't work anymore when you got that. So that's what happened when the serpent came to Eve. He talked her into just a little additional knowledge and compromised on the word a little bit. So what happened? Heaven consists of the word. They fell. I don't know that it was a dimension. I don't know what happened. But they fell from that blessed place they had with God. Whether there was a physical dimensional change, I have no idea. But nevertheless, they fell from the relationship they had with God and the entire earth and animal kingdom fell with them. 
So when I was contemplating on that the other day, and pardon me for reading, you know I'm trying to write a book, so that's why I'm thinking this way. The, uh, <clears throat> let me just read to you. It says, the results were greater than Adam had imagined in his wildest fears. The warning from God that he must not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of that day you die, it sounded bad. But I just never realized what the disobedience could bring, that it could be like this, went Adam's thoughts. Death. What is it to die? He had thought about this subject a little before the day it off, that Eve had offered him that uh, knowledge. But even as he was partaking, his mind kept running, but God loves me. I know he loves me. To die. To just be no more. That's one thing. But being on an earth that no longer produces as it did, and the animals are no longer friendly, they're enemies, they no longer obey me, the weather isn't perfect like it used to, the ground won't bring forth like it did. Well, even the weather not perfect like it was, well, before that happening with the serpent. That serpent, I hadn't thought of him for quite a while. That day, my. One moment he was standing there with Eve and I as God rebuked us. The next moment he looked like an overgrown worm, except mean. We really didn't need any knowledge outside the word God gave us, but that serpent convinced us, so we thought we needed it. One moment he was almost like us, walk, talk. He was a handsome sort of fellow, bigger than me too. Easy to see why Eve was convinced that what he said was probably true. And I guess worst of all, I don't see God anymore. He used to come in the coolie evening, talk to me. We had fellowship. I like that. I didn't realize how much I liked it until I didn't have it anymore. Sin does the same thing today. The blood of Jesus Christ has put us back into a fellowship with God. But these little things that creep into our life... Or if they don't creep in, little things that we hang on to by some form of reasoning. Well, after all, I'm only human. And for the single guys, well, you know, a man's supposed to have a wife and I don't have one. So therefore, and their mind goes this way and mind goes that way and they rationalize. No, there is no rational. We have been given victory over sin, the world, the flesh and the devil through Jesus Christ. Victory. It has been, it has been purchased. So therefore, in the Garden of Eden, there in chapter 3 where she fell, God, upon pronouncing the result of what they did and cursing the earth and the, and the serpent, and then in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So now we have two, a very strong doctrinal statement here. There is a seed of the serpent, and there is a seed of the woman. So every theologian that I've ever read all agree that the seed of the woman was Christ. Because it's the only time a woman ever had a seed without it being given to her by a man. So therefore, she, the woman, that seed, that, so therefore, now I'm going to take and, and use the prophet's interpretation. And he says, he, sa he said, and the meaning of that, he says, but I know you fell, but he said, I'm going to give you another chance at the word. I know you left the word, but I'm going to give you another chance. So therefore, the seed of the woman was the word made flesh. And so now here we'd come all the way up now to the nation of Israel and they, they were now being presented the word just like Eve had it. The difference being Eve was not fallen and by rejecting it fell. But now here's Israel already coming along in a fallen condition and yet finding grace with God and now a chance to step back into a redeemed position by receiving the very word that Eve put away and they couldn't receive it. It was offered to them but they couldn't receive it. So then God swings over and he turns to a Gentile group. And now he gives them, he gives them the word on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Ghost follows the word. Something the other ages never had. They had to follow it intellectually. Isn't that right? Sure they did. 
You think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all standing like they did under uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and going into the fiery furnace, being fed to the lions, all by just believing the word and no Holy Ghost? That's dedication. But now we come on up and now here a church, the Gentile church is given the word with the Holy Ghost. But Satan goes back to work again and then finally all working, 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 working down through the council of Nicaea. Then finally she rejects the truth to receive a, among other things the Trinity doctrine. So now the eve of the Gentile church has also rejected the word. But yet there's generations to come and God had already knew in his mind before the foundation of the world a family that he had already created, names he had already put on the book of life that must be redeemed. They are not going to fall. So consequently, he didn't just wipe his hands and say, well, I've tried it. I tried it with Eve. I tried it with Israel. I tried it with the Gentile church. They, none of them can receive it. Blow the whole thing off the map. He doesn't do that. God, rich in mercy. See? Why? Because he had certain attributes he was trying to show us. Amen. How, how long are we rich in mercy toward people who stumble? How long are we rich in mercy for people who just don't seem to come along as fast as we think they ought to? See? But look how patient God's been all these years. So then coming out of the dark ages after the church had kind of paid a heavy, heavy price... For having walked away from the word, God starts restoring with a water message, a blood message, and a spirit message to bring, to bring a church to a birth. To bring a church to a birth. That hasn't happened yet. Individuals are being born again, but the church has not been birthed yet. You got that. So therefore, for this church to be birthed, there had to be something different than what had happened in the previous ages. And God knew that, so this book that he'd been holding in his hand ever since Adam had to be opened up because God knew that the little mysteries hidden under those seals was the little trigger that was needed to wipe away the amnesia from his children's mind and show them where they came from and where they're going and quicken something inside of them that a group would not fall from the word. So therefore, in 1963, compared to the previous ages, this is part of this, that was what Jeff covered also the other day. When Jesus came to the Jews, he was called Son of Man. He was, he was the fullness of God in a body. He was a total declaration of the Logos that was in the beginning. He was the total declaration of this Christ, which is the Logos, the anointed word. So therefore, all that God was, he'd poured into Christ, and then Christ is now manifested in flesh. So therefore, now we have a total manifestation of the Father, and this brought on something, but still there was a mystery held back for our day. They didn't have the seals opened yet. But yet, we see that it was, it was a total manifestation unlike any other age. And then starting on the day of Pentecost, down comes the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Son of God dispensation, which is God in measure. Because every age was being spoken to by the seven spirits of God. Let's look at that now in Revelations. Again, we're overlapping with what Jeff said, but it all ties in. Besides, sometimes things need to be repeated. Seven spirits are mentioned in earlier in the, in the chapters in Revelations, but we won't look at those. I just want to pick up in chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So now, if we go back into the uh, tabernacle that was displayed on earth like Solomon's temple, we find a great candlestick burning with seven spheres on it. Not candlestick, actually seven lamps burning. 
And there, there they are, not quite in the presence of God. They're one veil out, but nevertheless, there they were burning. And now here they are, we're showing us what they are a reflection of. They're a reflection of something that Moses saw in heaven, seven fire, seven lamps burning before the throne. The verse goes on to say, which are the seven spirits of God. So therefore, this, this one fire illuminates seven candlesticks. And now the one has become seven. And of course the fire itself is God, Christ himself. And so now Christ has allocated one of seven to each of the seven church ages. And this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven measures anoints Paul, Irenaeus, Martin, Columba, Luther, Wesley, and William Branham. Okay. So now, now we've got a measure of Christ to a messenger to each age. And the people in each age then receive the word that he brings, which brings the measure that is offered to them. And they have an, an experience and they have met Christ for their age. In the measure given to the age. Then we come all the way up to 1963 and we find, we find now, wait, let me back up just a minute. Chapter 5 now. <clears throat> verse 6 and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having s seven horns <clears throat> now if we were to go back to Daniel in chapter 7 it, it speaks of excuse me chapter 8 it speaks of an animal with two horns and then it, when it describes it it says the two horns are the two kings and then it just, that's, a, that's a ram. And then it describes a goat with a single horn. And it says the single horn is the king of Grecia. So therefore the horn represents the king. And of course a king has a kingdom. So therefore the, the seven horns would be the seven kingdoms, which are the same as the seven church ages. Are we seeing together? Because each messenger is gathered to his people, just like they were in the Old Testament. Gathered to his people. So therefore, each messenger in each age is gathered to the people of his age. And each messenger to each age in eternity will be the, will be the, the king or whatever we want to call him, the head man over that group. Just like William Branham will be the head man over our group. Are we staying together now so far? Okay. So then therefore, there's, there's our seven horns, seven kings, and representing seven kingdoms, seven church ages. Then it says... And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So seven eyes, if we were looking at an Old Testament seven eyes, we would say seven prophets because they are seers. But in the New Testament, we don't move in that area. Most of them were not prophets. They were reformers. But nevertheless, the word came to them because they were, they were the receivers of the word for their day to give out the word and spirit in that measure to that age. Then we come on clear on up now. We got now the, William, the ministry of William Branham, the seventh church age messenger, also anointed with his one seventh. And he starts out then, starts out then bringing, bringing the message to the people and rebuking Pentecost for their, for their divisions among them. And God told him that I want you to plant two trees and stand between both of them. And he says, this tree is the people that believe the Trinity doctrine. And this tree is the, is the people that believe the oneness doctrine. Stand between them because I've got fruit in both camps. And then we keep moving along in the ministry of William Branham. First pull, sign in the hand. Second pull, discerning the heart. And he keeps talking about this third pull. This moving into something that he hasn't had that's greater than anything he's ever known in his ministry. And the people that write about Brother Branham, they read that and they automatically interpret it to mean he expected greater miracles. He might have, but when he opened the seals, he said, this is the most spiritual experience of my entire life. And he says, I hope you've caught it. This is that third pole. 
So came an opening of the word, not measure anymore, Amen. an opening of the word. Right. As Brother Branham, excuse me, as Jeff brought out to you, that in 1962, spoken word is the original seed. Pick up your pen and write. He says the Elijah ministry of Malachi 4 has not yet been fulfilled. But when they did the church age book in 64, he says the Malachi minis the ministry of Elijah and Malachi 4 has been fulfilled. So consequently then, in that span of time then, the Elijah ministry moved into, into position and the prophet began to emphasize Luke 17.30. The revealing of the Son of Man. And early in the ministry, they'd say, what is the Son of Man? He says, prophet, prophet, because he says, God had said to, was it Ezekiel, Son of Man, stand up, prophesy, Son of Man, do this, Son of Man, do that. And Jesus came announcing himself as Son of Man, and he said, what prophet? Because Moses had said, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like it unto me. So therefore, he kept prophet, prophet, prophet. But then later, he said, what is the Son of Man? He said, he's a prophet. He's the Word. He's the Logos that was in the beginning manifested. William Branham? No, the manifestation. So, Brother Branham, in his many part of his early ministry, you'll hear him saying, now if I'm not that one, I'm laying the platform for that one when he comes. And dozens of people around the world have tried to step on that platform and say, I'm the one. Look at me, I'm here. He laid a platform for me, I'm here. And they have no vindication, no word, no yeah. nothing, but they want to step on that platform. Yeah. But instead, we found that God took his prophet and moved him a step higher right. there himself. There you go back when he was speaking the storm out of existence upon that mountain in Colorado. And rebuking the storm because God told him to. Not because he had the power, just God told him to. Speak to the storm and it'll do what you say. And then God said, won't you come walk with me? And then he said, I was walking along. And he says, I st he thought he'd stop and give a little prayer of thanks for having such a good wife that always stays home and takes care of the kids. And he runs off on these hunting trips and she's never fussed and fumed about it. And what a wonderful wife she's been to me. And he was thanking God for it. And he said he was leaning up against this tree. And he looked over there and he says there was a, a, a doe and a little fawn come walking up. And he thought, well, now that's strange. How come they're not scared of me? And he said he talked to him. He says, don't you know that I could grab this rival and I could, I could shoot you both before you could get out get into the woods? And he says they just kept walking closer. And he said, I began crying. I, don't, I may have my sequence a little wrong here, but the story's right. And began crying, and he said, I heard a pat, 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 and he says, it was my own tears running off of my beard and dropping on the floor. And he said, and I looked at my hand, and it was young again. Did you ever catch that? And it was young again. So why, why did the deer not run from him? Because he had entered into something, walking with God. Just a little glimpse of something. That's where God's taking us, brothers and sisters. Yeah. One day, without tasting death, you'll have a short, quick pain. And it'll be the last pain you'll ever feel as the glorified body materializes around the word that you've held in your heart. Amen. This is that generation. I would like to say, I've got the faith that I'll see it. I don't have that faith. I'm old enough. God could take me at any time, but I sure hope I see it. I expect to, but I have no revelation on it. I have no revelation on it. But nevertheless, this is the generation. This is it. And so therefore, with God opening the seven seals, then he ties that to Revel the seventh seal to Revelations 10, 1 to 7, where in Revelations 10, 1, Christ, the mighty angel, comes down. No longer spirit by measure, but now fullness of Christ. Meaning what? Logos, which means what? Fullness of word. Not just theology now, the life of the word. The one that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness. The one, the one that spoke to Moses. All of that, that has returned. And then... In, in 1962, he preached a sermon called The Stature of a Perfect Man. 
And he says, we need this to get ready for those opening of those seven seals. That amazed me when I ran across that quote. We need this to get ready for that. What was this? To teach you that you need to be conformed to be a certain image of faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, to be ready for the capstone of Christ himself to incarnate a people. But we're not the proper temple until faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, and brotherly kindness are in position. Then we are a living image of the living God that at any time he can step into and declare himself in a full measure. We are not expecting a big super duper revival like the world is, is talking. Not under grace. The last sign the world received was the Elijah ministry. And of course they're trying to demolish that because they're all saying he went off at the end. When actually that's when he brought the corrective word to bring us back to the purity of the word. But because they love their tradition more than they love the word of God, they all said he went off at the end. He didn't. He brought us the focus right at the end that we could get geared in and be ready for the second coming of the Lord, which is the meeting in the air. This, this parousia, it's called, this presence that has come, this logos that has come, uh, I don't think anybody was looking for that. They were all looking for the, the bodily coming of the Lord. So this was something that came that I don't think any theologians were teaching that this, that this fullness of the Logos would come back to indwell a people. They were expecting that when Christ came back to earth, he'd be in the body with a nail-scarred hand. Not realizing that the climax to the New Testament is Jesus Christ in the form of the bride. Yes. And then that group meets him in the air. And the rest who refuse to receive what God has sent with a vindicated ministry with the opening of the seven seals, and we'll get into the seals on other services, with the opening of the seals, which released Christ after having been, quote, bound by creeds and dogmas for 2,000 years, that that, that that releasing is bringing something that God is trying to pour into us. And at the same time, every power of Satan is trying his best to make it as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, being totally caught up in the cares of life. Now you know you're under the influence of that. Because you, you, it's so easy to be all caught up in the cares of life. And, that's, and the prophet said the great temptation of the bride in America in this age will be worldliness. Caught up in the things, things of life. He says not sin, not sin, just all wrapped up in natural things. And it's so easy. When you look at the stock market today and it's just going wild. And people that never invested in the stock market. Oh, maybe I ought to put my money there. And this company's going great. And this company's going great. And everything's going great. Oh man, I'll make it there. I'll make it here. We want to make it in the kingdom. That's where we want to make it. So we have to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm not saying put these other things aside. I think we're prospering so that we can get the gospel out. I believe God is doing that for us. So there's, there's nothing wrong with, with you know, being well off financially if you hold the kingdom in the proper place. But if, you, if it's strictly for your benefit and your better life and your better this, you're missing the purpose of God. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And God says, and all these other things will be added unto you. So we have to keep our focus on the word and prayer and the proper amount of fellowship. Not overboard, but not too little either. You can't, you can't survive isolated like an island, just living by yourself. Neither do you want to waste all kinds of time with, quote, fellowship. Your, your primary fellowship should be with you and the Lord. Amen. 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 And then the saints, and then, of course, church. We've got our work to do, and God help us to find the balance in all of it. Amen. We'll close for tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Much material, but one focus, and that's you. Lord Jesus, what a wonderful thing you have done in this age. May we not miss it. May we take full advantage of it. 
and draw on it to the best of the ability that you can give us, Lord. To not get caught in the cares of American living or Laodicean living, because the whole world's caught in that. But God, may we find our focus in you and our satisfaction in you. May you be our every portion that we, satisfying every little longing inside, Lord. May you be that satisfying portion. Help us, Lord, where we're falling short. But thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and have done. You who started the work, you will finish it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.